Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at today's webinar, Licensure for Internationally Trained Engineers. Now, anytime during this webinar, feel free to talk with us through the chat if you just want to say hi, or if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature. We will have a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. I also want to remind everyone to please take our short survey afterwards. I'll be sending it to you in an email afterwards, so don't worry about writing on this URL. But any feedback we can get from our audience is very helpful for our future webinars. Now, who's here today? My name is Gavin. I'm the content developer for the Career Loans Program. Our guest speaker today is Anna Yat, International Qualifications Service Officer with APEGA. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Venus, who is an information and financial counselor with the Career Loans Program. So what is the Career Loans Program? We have a short video, which sort of highlights what we do. Um, so I'll, I'll let the video do the explaining first. I'm Rianne Mendoza, and I came to Canada from the Philippines last year in November. Hello, my name is Ifoma. I came to Canada June 2019. My desired occupation in Canada is a privacy lawyer. And my desire is to work as a medical doctor in Canada. The major challenge that I was facing was financial. I don't have the sufficient resources in order for me to enroll. I used part of the money that I got from career loans to register for the first part of the exam. I was able to enroll in the training programs to becoming a privacy professional. To buy a mini laptop that I would use to prepare for the exams. To purchase all the required texts. Ever since I applied to career loans, I can say that my career outlook is definitely brighter. I will also be getting my certification for Asia. Because I've gotten the assistance that I needed, I've been able to register for the exams. I am now more prepared to become a privacy professional in Canada. Things are looking brighter. Yeah, I just feel like, you know, I'm getting closer to my goal. And thanks to career loans, I am now more confident and in my way towards my journey of becoming a privacy professional here in Canada. Okay, now for today's schedule. First, I'll be introducing our guest speaker today, and then we will hear Anna Yat's presentation about licensure for internationally trained engineers. Afterwards, we'll hear more about the Career Loans Program from Venus, and then we will have our Q&A session. So anytime during today's webinar, feel free to leave a comment in the Q&A section, and we'll be able to get to them at the end of today's webinar. So first, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Enayat. So please uh, turn on your camera uh, and say hi to everyone. Enayat joined APEGA in 2014 in the registration department. He helps engineering and geoscience applicants navigate the licensing process in Alberta and provides guidance to applicants on articulating work experience in relevant manner. 
NEAT's professional background has revolved around academic credential evaluation, professional regulatory arena, and economic immigration. NEAT is based in Edmonton, but his work at APEGA takes him all over the province. Thank you for joining us today, Anyat. Thank you for having me. Um, so without further ado, we will give you the stage um, and please feel free to share your screen, your slides. Sounds okay. good. Looks good, perfect. Take it away, Anyat. Awesome. Well, hello everybody. I'm happy to be here and I'm hoping that what I shared today is going to be of some value to you. I know this webinar is being recorded, uh, but if you're an applicant uh, looking to uh, apply for a registration with the PEGA, you need to make sure that you look at the website and, and the information that would be most up to date uh, because our uh, uh, registration process and some, some documentation requirements and some procedures may it may change in the in the next uh, coming months uh, or 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 year, depending on when you're watching this webinar. But uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, when you are ready to apply, you consult the APEGA website at that time because that will be the the uh, uh, main source of of information in 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 truth when it comes to the licensure requirements. Uh, the uh, the other thing I wanted to mention right in the outset is that what I'm going to share with you uh, it's it's very much specific to the province of Alberta and its requirements for uh, in engineering applicants to go through the registration uh, process. So if you are interested in applying to other jurisdictions, I suggest you uh, seek information from those uh, as associations that regulate the profession of en engineering. Uh, I, I also wanted to uh, write in, in, in the outset, talk about this whole idea of, of regulation. Why is uh, a profession regulated in Canada or around the world? Now, one, one of the things that would be different in, in Canada from some of the countries that some of you might be coming from is that the uh, profession of engineering may not be regulated as it is in, in Canada or as, as other professions in your country, such as uh, doctors, uh, lawyers, uh, pharmacists, nurses, uh, and in other professions that, that are regulated. Engineering may not be regulated. Uh, you, you may have to be registered with, with a government body or a technical society, but you may not have to go through an engineering licensing uh, uh, process in Canada. The, juris the jurisdictions across Canada have a mandate from their local governments to uh, regulate the uh, profession uh, of, of engineering by uh, providing a very um, specific licensure requirements and re registration process. Uh, but if you are registered in, in one province and you are a professional member in good standing, it is possible to uh, to, to transfer that membership to an, another association uh, within uh, Canada uh, without going through the entire application process. Uh, but uh, the main point here is that the uh, re regulation uh, uh, to regulate the profession of engineering uh, in, in Alberta and across Canada is very much a jurisdictional um, uh, mandate that comes from the local government. APEGA also regulates the profession of, uh, of, of geoscience along with engineering. Um, I'm understanding that everybody on this webinar or anybody who would be uh, listening or looking at this webinar would, would have an engineering background. So I'm not going to mention any, anything about geoscience requirements. Uh, if there are any, any questions around that uh, uh, profession, I'm happy to answer them. So I already mentioned that the, the local governments have uh, a legislation, a law that mandates organizations like APEGA to regulate the profession on behalf of the local government. So for Alberta, uh, the government of, of Alberta uh, passed the Engineering and Geoscience Professions Act back in 1920, uh, a little over 100 years ago, to regulate the, the professions of engineering and geoscience. And all the licensure requirements uh, that APEGA imposes 
on applicants come directly from this legislation. It's a public document. Uh, I, I, I welcome anybody who is in, interested in, in, in looking at this. Just uh, go on Google and say Engineering and Geoscience Pro Professions Act Alberta, and you will be able to find uh, this um, uh, piece of legislation. APEGA's mandate, like I said, comes for, from the legislation, which is the Engineering and Geoscience Professions Act. And, and as part of the mandate, APEGA has two functions. One, as a non-statutory, which is a very much a support role, a role that APEGA offers to uh, professional engineers um, in, in other designations within the, the engineering professions at APEGA to make sure that, uh, that those who are practicing have the resources and, and, and the knowledge and, uh, and the standards that they're uh, supposed to be adhering or following are all there. So there is a support mechanism. But uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the statutory uh, function of APEGA, which includes functions like um, registration, investigations, uh, discipline, and enforcement. Our focus for, for today is very much going to be registration, but the, uh, but the legislation gives APEGA the authority to also investigate uh, any complaints that might come against uh, APEGA's members. Uh, and if those investigations yield positive, then there is a disciplinary committee that will discipline that individual or, or company in, in question, uh, very much according to the severity of, of, uh, uh, of, of the offense. Uh, and APEGA uh, has uh, the, the authority to enforce the legislation uh, by making sure that only those individuals and, and companies who are qualified, competent, and registered with APEGA are offering engineering services to the Alberta public. The, the Engineering and Geoscience Professions Act uh, provides uh, licensure requirements, as I mentioned earlier, but it also uh, gives uh, the, the, uh, uh, the profession a definition of, of what the practice of engineering is. So this is the definition that the Board of Examiners are going to be uh, looking at when they are reviewing applicants' qualifications. So applic um, applicants' qualifications, both experience and education are going to be compared against this definition. I'm not going to be reading the entire definition. You could do that uh, perhaps uh, faster than, than I can. But one, one of the things that I, that I wanted to highlight is that the uh, practice of engineering is the professional application of the principles of mathematics, chemistry, physics, or any related applied subject. So uh, in essence, um, the, the practice of engineering is, is very much the professional application of physical sciences. Now, the key term here is professional. The, the, the application of theory or application of in, in, engineering standards has to be at the professional level. Um, there are um, other levels of application of, of, of theory, uh, such as technologist level, which will be um, a lot less complex than professional level of application of, of theory or technician level of application of engineering theory, which will be a, a, a very basic application of engineering standards. So uh, one thing that you should take away from this definition is that the application of engineering theory has to be at the professional level in order for uh, an, an applicant to meet uh, the, the uh, uh, licensure requirements for pro professional membership. Now, I wanted to uh, uh, quickly talk about the application pro, uh, process. Uh, so you have an idea as to how, how the, the applications are uh, received and, and processed. All the applications are available online. As an applicant, you will start an application online. And because uh, mo uh, mo most of you or all of you will have uh, at least one credential from outside of Canada, uh, you need to uh, provide a, a credential evaluation report from WES, which is World Education Services. May, many of you might know, uh, but this evaluation basically tells APEGA's Board of Examiners what is the level of your education. Uh, 
Now, in order for um, uh, a professional membership obligation to meet the education requirements, the education must be at the uh, university level. And this report will, will, will tell the Board of Examiners as to what is the, the general level of, of, of your education. Now, the West assessment will only tell uh, the APEGA Board of Examiners uh, uh, a generic level of, of your education, but the actual uh, uh, assessment of the contents of your program, your, your engineering program, will be something that the Board of Examiners will have to review. Now, uh, application has a lot of uh, information and documentation that, that has to be submitted by, by the applicant. And once the application is submitted, the uh, APEGA staff will do a quick internal check to make sure that all the information and documentation that's required for a full review by the Board of Examiners, they are there. If there's anything missing, uh, the application is, is put on hold you, and you'll be asked to provide further in information because the information received was not sufficient. My suggestion is that only submit an application that is complete. Otherwise, it will take, uh, it would add time to your overall application uh, process um, and, and, and application timeline. For professional number application, uh, the, the application will go through two reviews by the Board of Examiners. One for the academic review or, or education review, and second is experience review, uh, which, which I'll talk a bit more uh, uh, later on. But each review, academic and experience review, is done by uh, by a volunteer board of examiners who will provide recommendation on their review. And then the registration executive committee will make a decision ba based on those uh, recommendations. And then the APEGA staff will communicate what that decision is uh, to, the, uh, to the applicant. Now, the, uh, the, the outcome for decisions could be one of three. Either the application is approved because the applicant has met all the requirements, or the application is deferred because the, uh, the, the applicant has been asked to provide uh, either further um, ex experience, uh, competencies, or uh, the uh, applicant has been asked to write some exams. Uh, the third outcome could be that the application is refused for, for and that could be for, for several reasons. Maybe uh, applicant's education was, was not in engineering or there is a character issue, um, but, but there is a huge difference between refuse and deferred. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that I can, uh, I, I highlight that. Now let's, let's, let's talk about some of the application types uh, that uh, you as an applicant could apply for. Um, the professional membership application uh, is, um, is, is the full license uh, application to be able to practice independently uh, in the province of Alberta. And the application requirements for that is that you must have an engineering um, education at the post-secondary level. Uh, and, and the minimum requirement is that you apply with a minimum of two years of university, university level um, engineering education. Now, the minimum two years will make you eligible, but it's not enough to make you academically qualified, which means that if you apply with, with anything less than a university level full program that's compared to a Canadian um, program, then uh, it is possible that the uh, that you as an applicant will be assigned a number of a, a exams, but I just wanted to also draw the difference between being eligible to apply and being academically qualified. Being eligible to apply again, you you must have a minimum of two years of university level education in engineering, and then in order for you to meet all all the academic requirements, your education must be. Uh, or, or the, the contents of your education must be uh, substantially similar to an engineering program that, uh, that, is, that is completed by a Canadian graduate in, in, in Canada, because the engineering programs are accredited through the, um, the Canadian Accreditation Board. 
um, uh, in, in all the contents of your program are compared against that. Now you're able to see what, what, is, what is included in, uh, in, in an approved engineering syllabus. And, and you can do that by going to the, uh, on, on the APEGA website and going into the exam sections in the course e e equivalence tab, you, you'll be able to uh, see the different disciplines in the, in the, in, in the, in the syllabus for, for each of those um, disciplines so that you can compare the one that you have completed. Now, the, the second aspect of the uh, requirement is experience. At minimum, the re registration requirement is that 48 months of ex experience must be submitted uh, in order for the applic applicant to be eligible to apply. If, even if you have 47 months, uh, you, you, you cannot apply for a professional membership because um, the, the legislation actually uh, requires a minimum 48 months of engineering experience. If, if English is not your first language or your bachelor's degree was not delivered in the English language, you must provide um, uh, competency in, in, the, in the English language, which I will, I will speak to a, a little bit more later. Uh, you need to demonstrate knowledge of law, ethics, and, and professionalism. And, and you do that by writing and passing the national professional practice exam, which every engineering applicant uh, must write, no matter if you're a Canadian graduate or, or internationally trained. Um, last but not least, you must have uh, your um, uh, uh, reputation and, and, and character in, in, in good standing. Uh, and this is one of the areas that sometimes applicants meeting all the other requirements, they are not able to uh, get licensed because there is an issue with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with their character or reputation, or they have had some kind of, uh, uh, um, of challenges with the, with, with the law. Uh, one thing that I also wanted to, to mention as part of uh, a professional membership, in order for you to be eligible to apply for professional membership, you must be a Canadian permanent resident or, or, or Canadian citizen. If you're, if you're not, that's fine. There is another category called licensee, which pretty much gives you the exact same privileges as a, as, as a professional member. Now, the second uh, type of application that you could apply is called professional licensee. Now, professional licensee is, is, a, uh, is a limited license. Uh, and what I mean by that is that as a professional member, there's no limitation on the scope of practice. However, with the professional licensee, there is a limitation on the scope of your practice because uh, you will only be licensed in the area that you specialize in and that you are competent in because the requirements are different for this type of license. There has to be a, a minimum of two years of post-secondary education, uh, and you could apply for, for, for this uh, designation even with a two-year uh, diploma program. So, so this is where um, uh, this, uh, the, uh, this whole idea about the evaluation of your credentials uh, from from uh, from other countries will come into play because if 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 your West assessment comes in at at a two year post secondary diploma, then maybe you might want to look at uh, a professional licensee designation rather than professional membership because chances are you'll be assigned a large number of exams as a professional member uh, applicant. But with a professional licensee, you, 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 you may meet this requirement and don't have to write any exams. Uh, the experience requirement for professional licensee is 72 months. Uh, and so 72 months is a bit more than, than what's required for professional membership. And this is, again, because the educational requirement is, is lower. Uh, you must have English language competency if English is not your first language or or if your bachelor's degree was not delivered in the English language, uh, you must have uh, knowledge of law, ethics, and professionalism uh, by writing the by writing and passing the national pro professional practice exam. Uh, you must be of good character and reputation, like the professional membership requirement. The third 
application type that I, I, I wanted to also talk about is called member and training. As the name suggests, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an application type where the, the requirements are only for education and good character. There's no experience required because the applicant may not have uh, the minimum 48 months of, of, of experience. Uh, now, with the experience, as long as you have 48 months of experience, even if it's international experience, all of it, you should consider applying for professional membership and not for member in training because member in training is for folks who, who just meet the, the education requirements because they, they haven't been uh, working yet or, or haven't been able to accumulate 48 months of engineering experience. Now, for these three designations, um, uh, I, I wanted to uh, go back and sort of summarize the fact that for professional membership uh, application or professional membership designation, there's no limitation on the scope of uh, practice, which means that your registration will say that you are a licensed engineer, or so, sorry, that you are a professional engineer, and it will not say that you are a mechanical engineer or civil engineer or electrical engineer because the registration does not have any limitation on the scope of practice. However, you are required um, to only practice in an area that you feel most uh, 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 most competent in, in the area that you are knowledgeable, but mo most importantly, you should only practice in an area that you can take technical responsibility for that work because once you do, you will be professionally and legally um, uh, liable for uh, the, the, the engineering work that you authenticate. Now, in terms of rights to title, as a professional member, you've got full rights to, to title, which means that you can practice independently, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, use the term engineering uh, or engineer as, as, as your job title. Uh, and the designation for professional member is, a P, uh, is called PNG. Now, for professional licensee, remember this was the limited license. Uh, the scope of practice is, is limited because you can only practice independently in an area that you specialize in based on your past experience. And you do have the right to title because you can use the term engineer in your job title. And the designation is PLNG uh, for this designation, uh, for this membership type. Now for member in training, like I said, uh, the only requirement is, is education and, and being of good character. You cannot practice independently, which means that you, you have to be supervised or your engineering work has to be controlled by a professional member, especially if that experience is being gained in, in Canada. And you do have the right to title. You can use the term engineer as, as part of your title, but you need to clarify that you are an um, engineer in training uh, in whatever discipline that you are practicing uh, in. So uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the experience requirement, um, I, I usually spend a, a little bit of time on the experience side because uh, experience is, um, is one area that a lot of applicants have uh, challenges in, in articulating it in a manner that would be, um, that would give the, the APEGA Board of Examiners um, a clear picture of your abilities as a professional uh, engineer. Um, APEGA a number of years ago adopted uh, uh, a, the CBA system, which is competency-based assessment. It's, um, it's a way of evaluating experience. Uh, based on, on very specific uh, competencies. Now, the uh, CBA system or, or uh, uh, competency-based assessment system is a, a professional competence model that has three pillars, knowledge, skills, and attitude. The, the applicant must demonstrate that they have gained uh, their, their, their theoretical knowledge as part of their education, as, as part of their post-secondary education. But then they have also demonstrated th their, their ability to apply that knowledge in creating practical solutions. And, and they need to have the appropriate professional attitudes, uh, which means that they should always, or they must always keep the public safety in mind. They should never um, undertake any engineering acti activities that can that can put the, the uh, public in harm's way. 
uh, the Board of Examiners uh, have a definition for CBA, uh, and and it is as follows. I will I will actually read this one because I think it's it, it's important. Uh, so CBA, according to the Board of Examiners, is a process which determines an applicant's suitability for licensure by verifying and reviewing their ability to perform engineering tasks through competencies. Now. The important um, term terminology used here um, that I wanted to highlight is called su su suitability. What the Board of Examiners are looking for is whether the applicant is suitable, suitable for professional membership in independent practice. What makes um, uh, an, uh, a, an engineer suitable to practice independently? Well, again, we would go back to those three pillars that I mentioned earlier, that as an applicant, you must demonstrate that you have knowledge of engineering theory, um, but you also have the ability to, to apply that theory uh, and, and you do have uh, the, the public safety at the heart of all of your engineering practice. The CBA system is comprised of, of six categories and within each of these categories, there are a number of key competencies. So in total, there are 22 key competencies that every engineering applicant must demonstrate a level of expertise. Now, how do you do that? How do you demonstrate that? Well, you, you demonstrate that by, by providing examples from your past experience and in showcasing your, your, your skills and abilities and knowledge of each, each of the key competencies that's required for you to demonstrate a level of expertise. Uh, now, if, if you notice, uh, there are uh, there are numbers within each of these categories, which indicate that within each of those categories, the number in, in bracket shows how many key competencies there are. Now, in terms of the CBA uh, uh, process, it's um, it's it's a form based system. As an applicant, you will have to complete a number of forms. And in those forms, you would provide information about your employment history, about your, your technical abilities uh, uh, by, by providing ex examples uh, and contact information for your references and validators. So references are individuals who will confirm your employment pe period. So if you're drawing examples for each of those key competencies for, for, for from your previous experience, you need to make sure that you are able to provide a confirmation by, um, through a, a reference which APEGA will, will follow up. So the references will be able to um, confirm to APEGA that you worked in that company for that period of time that you have indicated. And, and references don't have to be uh, um, en engineers. Now, on the other hand, validators need to be en engineers and they need to be supervisors, um, senior practitioners, professional members and PNGs. And uh, if, if any of your experiences in Canada, the, the validators must be a PNG. But if your experience is from outside of Canada, then the, the validator has to be uh, an engineer, but someone who supervises you, someone who has way more experience than, than, than you do, um, who would have overlooked your, your, your engineering work. And they will be able to, to validate or confirm your, your specific examples for each of those key competencies. And once APEGA receives uh, uh, the, the, uh, the questionnaire that's been sent to your references and, 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 and validators, then that information is collected and, and provided to the Board of Examiners. And then the examiners uh, um, that, are, that are at APEGA, which is a volunteer board, they will also do a review of, of all your um, competencies, the examples that you have provided in the feedback that's been received from your references and validators. And they, they will make a re recommendation based on their review of your overall application. And then the executive committee of the board of examiners will make a decision based on those uh, recommendations. Now, what, one thing that I wanted to also hi highlight for the CBA system is that there's something called um, uh, scoring or, or rating. Each of your examples for each of the key competencies is, is rated or scored uh, on a scale of, of zero to five. And this happens three times. One, by, um, by the applicant. So as an applicant, you, you will conduct a self-scoring 
from zero to five for each of the of those key competencies to 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 tell uh, Apega according to you well, what is your level of, of of expertise knowledge or or, or experience for each of those key competencies. Um, and then your validators will also uh, score or rate each, each of the key competencies uh, that you have identified them for. Uh, and then the third time that the scoring happens will be by the, uh, by the APEGA board of examiners or the APEGA examiners will also score each, each of your key competencies from zero to five. Now, in, in terms of um, um, the, um, how, what makes your membership in good standing? Because after going through the registration process, when you do become a, uh, um, a, a full member with, with APEGA or, or a practicing member with, with APEGA, you, you need to make sure that you continue to keep that membership in good standing, which means that you need to make sure that you, you, you pay your annual dues, which is your financial obligation. You need, you need to make sure that you continuously learn and, and update yourself um, uh, in the profession by, by making sure that you meet all of the continuing professional development uh, requirements that APEGA has. And, and you can find out more information on that on, on the APEGA website. So you must be CPD compliant, which means uh, CPD stands for continuing professional development. And if there are any, any orders or any investigations or any disciplines, you, 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 you must um, uh, satisfy them all and that you're always in compliant with the AGP Act. Uh, you should never do anything that will, that, that will be deemed as, as um, in breach of the legislation. Um, so, so these are these are some of the things that you would have to do in order for for your your uh, designation to be in good standing with with the PEGA. Now, this is where I'm going to stop. Uh, I have my email uh, address on the on the screen. Feel free to email me with any any questions that you have. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, uh, answer any any questions you you have on in this webinar during our, our Q and A. Uh, but beyond that, you have my email address. If if you come across any questions, I'll be happy to to answer them. But again, if you are looking to apply, you need to make sure that you go on the APEGA website to make sure that you're you're looking at the most up to date information. Gavin, back to you. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, so if you have any questions, like Annette said please feel free to use the Q&A section and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Before that though, I'd like to introduce uh, Venus to share her screen as she will be giving us a brief presentation about the career loans program and how we can help assist newcomers who are trying to return to their careers. Hi Venus. Hi Gavin, hi everyone. I'll be presenting to you um, the, some information about uh, what the career loans program is and how our process actually works. So our program, Career Loans, is funded by Government of Canada, coordinated by ACHIEVE, and our financial institution partner is HSBC Bank. Venus, you're free to share your, your screen oh, as well. I'm sorry, I think. Can you see it now? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, about career loans, it's a fully virtual service for internationally trained individuals in the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. So, sorry, like... Venus, could you make it full screen? Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Perfect. Is it good right. now? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So uh, we provide free, free uh, support services, career support services, and assistance with the micro loan application to um, internationally trained professionals. And also, we uh, guide you whether you wanted to go back to your career or you wanted to consider an alternative career. Both are options that if you consider any, we support both. 
some features about the program, we offer free career and financial counseling, as well as a low interest uh, micro loan up to $15,000. The minimum is $1,500. Also referrals to employment services, should you need it, and a guide to accreditation process and whether you are, you know, you are considering alternative careers and you like to get some insight and you wanted to share. So definitely we can provide some advice on that. Who is eligible? So internationally trained individuals in regulated or non-regulated occupations and trades. Of course, residents of Alberta and Saskatchewan. And uh, for immigration status, we consider permanent residents, Canadian citizens, and convention refugees. And also for the language, uh, the Canadian language benchmark of level five, so that you can uh, comfortably communicate in your training program. And some benefits if you become a member of Korea Loans Program, uh, you know, support services from the expert counselors. Um, a personalized personalized one on one session so that is um, that is basically the career counseling that we offer once you register with the program. Um, you know discussing your career path and options and then after that the the one on one career counseling program we create a personalized action plan for you and um, all the consultation and services actually is virtual, is through the phone or online platform. You have access to the webinars, to the sessions like today, very informative, um, and also access to the expert guest speakers on the topics uh, that is relevant to your career. And also access to the previous webinars, um, as well as access to our calendars of event. So this will show you um, how the process works. Basically, once you decide whether you wanted to go back to your career or you're considering a different, an alternative career, you can just approach us, register for our program. We get in touch with you to set up a virtual session. Uh, it's about half an hour of basically getting to know you better and, and considering like going through the, the options with you and um, you know, at that point, we create a personalized action plan for you. Now, if you decide to go on with a loan application uh, for the training program, and then we work further with you to create a, um, a file for you, and then refer you to our financial partner, which is HSBC Bank, and um, you know, at that point, we just meet with them. And uh, once you get approved and you go uh, for your training, we continue to support you um, till the end of the loan application process and beyond. So as I said, um, the, the counseling sessions are virtual, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, we can discuss the career path and next steps for you. And if you need referral to the local employment services, we definitely can do that for you um, based on your personal situation. And should you need a, um, a micro loan, we can definitely assist you with the application. So about the loan, as I said, the financial partner is HSBC Bank and the maximum is $15,000. The minimum is $1,500. The interest rate is HSBC Prime plus 2%. At the moment, it is sitting at 4.45. The term of the loan is up to four years. And as I said, throughout the application process and beyond that, you get support by the, uh, from the career loans uh, counselors. Some eligible expenses, if I want to go through the list, you can claim credential assessment, accreditation fees, any, um, you know, training, any course, course fees, any learning material and equipment fees. And if you want to pay for the exams and licensure, membership, all of that can be covered under the loan. If there is anything that you're not sure, please make sure that you discuss because we might 
be able to find an option to cover that as well, provided that it is not exceeding the $15,000. So the program is completely free, funded by government of Canada, and it is virtual. There is no in-person service. Um, as I said, it's by, by phone and through online platforms. So, you know, once you register for the program, which is a very short and simple process, it's just you visiting our, our website and you just send an application, like a registration form in, we get in touch with you. Um, there is no obligation to take out the loan. The loan uh, portion of the program is there should you need to access it. So if you just wanted to basically discuss options in terms of your career, feel free to do that. That is the end of my presentation. Here is my contact information. I am the information and financial counselor as, as Gavin mentioned for Alberta. I'll be happy to assist you. If there is anything that you're not clear about, whether, whether you are eligible or not, please get in touch. We can discuss um, like your situation in person. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Venus. Now we'd like to move on to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. So Anaya, you could please come back on. We would be able to answer some of these questions. And of course, if you still have questions, do feel free to type them into the Q&A. Uh, Anaya, a few questions about the character and reputation requirements. Uh, the first one is for, for the character and reputation requirements, how can newcomers provide proof of this to the board? Would you be able to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so this is all part of the application. Um, depending on what you're ap applying uh, for, if you're applying for a member in training, there is a nine point questionnaire that you must answer. And if, if the answer to any one of those questions is a yes, then Napega will, will uh, come back to you and ask you for explanation because there, there was probably a situation where um, uh, it was re relevant to your uh, good character and reputation requirement. But if you're applying for professional membership, uh, APEGA, because APEGA collects inf information from uh, not only you as an applicant, but also your references and validators through the questionnaires. So APEGA will ask a number of questions and ask for feedback from your validators and, and your references. Um, so that's that's another another source of information for Apega to see, um, you know, if there is any issues with with your character and reputation, and also sometimes Apega will receive uh, um, uh, inf information from the public uh, regarding uh, applicants regarding uh, members, uh, where Apega will certainly investigate those. So as long as you are not being asked to provide more information. Uh, that means there is probably no, no issue at, at, at the time. So I wouldn't worry about it in the outset uh, too much, unless you, you know that there's going to be an issue at, at which point you should be very much honest and open because it's a lot easier to deal with, uh, with, with that kind of an issue right in the outset because you were, you were honest enough to come forward rather than a peg of finding out you know, after the, the application or when you become a member, then it'll be a bigger issue because you did not come forward to a beggar right from, from the beginning because ethics is, is a huge element of not only uh, 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 as, 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 a prof, as a professional, but also as an applicant as well. A lot of the information that a PEGA asks is, is very much uh, based on trust, uh, trust that applicants will be um, truthful, honest, uh, and, 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 and forthcoming. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I think this might be a follow-up question. So what will happen if the self-scoring, the validator scoring, and the committee scoring have discrepancies at certain amounts of competencies? Has this, have you ever found such a situation in the licensing, licensure process? Of course, of course, because we uh, um, applicant will not know what what the validators are scoring, and and validators will, will not know what the what the APEGA examiners are scoring. But the the main point is that if 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 you have demonstrated professional level abilities, the difference 
in the scoring will not be that much. Uh, so uh, for for the validator, well, the validator will actually know what what the applicant has put in terms of the score, but but the applicant will not know what the validator is, is, is scoring because that information is sent directly to APEGA by the validator. So um, yeah, th there can be um, discrepancies because it, the, the scoring or rating is done by three different human beings, it's, it's, it's possible. But as long as you know, it's, it's, it's in the ballpark of, of, the, uh, um, of, of the applicant's uh, abilities, uh, because there are minimums. If if the scoring is zero for any of the key competencies, whether it's it's by the validator or or examiner, which means or the applicant, which means that the applicant does not have any expertise or knowledge or experience in that key competency, then the application cannot be um, approved because uh, the applicant lacks that that key key competency. So so at, at, at minimum, the scoring for each of the key competencies should be a one. Maximum is of course five. But say you know the 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 um, the, the applicant, the validator and the examiner have scored differently. Uh, applicant said three, the validator said two, the the APEG examiner said three. Well it's um, it's it's more than min, min, minimum, so it's not going to have a huge impact on on the overall approval of the of the application. But one thing that the applicant should remember is that for each of the key competency, the minimum is a one, and the the competency categories, the six categories that I mentioned in the presentation, the average for each of those categories has to be for for some there's it's three and and for some it's two. So my suggestion is that you go on the APEGA website and download the CBA guide to, to uh, give you all this information. All right, uh, another question came, came in about the process. Uh, for the APEGA CBA process, is there a timeline from an applicant's first interest to the final decision by APEGA? If you can give a, maybe a rough estimate or some sort of timeline about that. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the the board of examiners will re, will review applications because it's the board of examiners that uh, have the authority to to both review and make decision on, on the applications. But in order for them to receive the application, the information has to be complete. So the applicant must provide complete information uh, for for all the requirements in the application process. But applicants have up to 90 days to work on their application, open an application, and with, without paying fees, uh, applicants can, can work on their application for 90 days. But they need to make sure that before the 90th day, they submit the application by paying the fees. That's when they, they, they have to pay the fees. If they're ready earlier, fine, that's good. But if not, if they do not submit the application by 90 days, the application will be deleted because it's not the, in the, uh, the APEGA um, internal application system as yet, it's in the cloud. But say overall the application is complete uh, and, and uh, the, um, the, the, the APEGA staff are not going back and forth with the applicant to, to, get, to get more information because everything that's required is, is there. Um, APEGA strives to review and make decisions on those applications within six months. Six months. Okay. Some 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 take um, take longer, and that's because either the application is not complete right from the get go, or the references and validators are not getting back to to APEGA. So, as an applicant, you need to make sure that before you identify who who's going to be your reference or validator, uh, they are uh, they are aware that APEGA will contact them uh, contact them, and that they should respond to APEGA. In, in, in a timely manner, otherwise it'll just add to the overall processing times. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you, you mentioned, you briefly mentioned fees. Could you maybe talk about like a rough estimate of, of how much uh, an applicant would be looking to pay in terms of fees for this application process? Yeah, so for professional membership application, the, the fee is 500 plus the GST. But then it depends if, if the assessment uh, of their qualifications comes back with any exams, then, then for each of those exams, there are fees to, to write those exams. 
if they don't have any any exams assigned to them, that there is one exam that they must write, which is the National Professional Practice Exam. So each ap applica application will be different in terms of how much is it going to cost them to go through the, the entire licensure process. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and just to touch base with Venus, uh, any, any members who, who do need financial assistance, uh, they can reach out to Career Loan Services. Uh, Venus, the, this application process is definitely one of the things which are eligible for our microloan. Is that correct? Definitely, yes. Um, licensure uh, fees and membership fees, definitely they qualify um, to be claimed against the loan. Yes, Absolutely. but just, just, just keep in mind that the minimum is $1,500. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question, this is for Anayat. Um, so does one applicant need to be Alberta residents to apply for APEGA? Any limitations for residency? Uh, so APEGA is Alberta based, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, but there are other regulatory bodies in other provinces. Could you maybe talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so, so there's no local re residency requirement. Uh, the, the only requirement for professional membership uh, application would be that uh, you as an applicant must be a permanent resident of Canada. You don't have to be living uh, in, in Alberta or you could be in Alberta, you start the application, but you move to another province. Uh, you can still continue with, with your application at APEGA. So, uh, so you don't have to be physically located in Alberta. Awesome. Um, and just a follow-up question on that note, let's say a member did they, they registered in Alberta. They did move to um, Saskatchewan, for, for instance. Uh, in, this, in this situation, uh, could you, I know you talked briefly about it in your presentation, but could you maybe shed a little bit more light on the, that transfer process? Yeah, so as, as long as the professional membership designation is in good standing, and, and, I, and I talked about you know, a, a number of things that are... Uh, um, part of being a member in good standing, you can apply for that membership to, to, to transfer to an, another jurisdiction, which, which means that you can hold multiple um, licenses in, 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 in different uh, uh, parts of, of, of Canada. So you could be licensed in Alberta, Ontario, BC, as many as, as you like. But as long as your membership is in good standing, you don't have to go through the entire application process, which means that all you have to, to do is, is, um, is up, apply with, with another jurisdiction and, and let them know that you are a, an active member in another jurisdiction. And then the jurisdictions start between themselves. And once they, they, they get that confirmation, they, you will get the exact same um, uh, membership uh, uh, type or, or level in that jurisdiction as, as well. Great. Thank you for clarifying. I think that's all the questions for today. So we're going to wrap up today's webinar and uh, I will be giving out the contact information once again. So if there are any last minute questions for Anayat, for Venus, for Venus, we will be leaving the contact information below. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, once again. So we do have, so we do have an upcoming webinar next month. That's interview tips for Canadian for new Canadians. If you are struggling with these interview tips, you definitely don't want to miss this one. It's on July fifteenth. I'll send out more details in the follow up email, and and as I said, everyone's contact information. If you're a Saskatchewan prospective member of Career Loans, our information is there. Alberta, contact the one eight hundred and the email is there for Venus as well. And if you want to reach out to Enayat, his email is there as well. Uh, I think that's going to do it for today's webinar. Thank you, Enayat, for joining us. And I'm sure our audience members found this webinar extremely useful. Thank you very much again. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank All you. right. And thank you for the audience for joining us. Have a great day. I will be sending out this recording shortly. So stay tuned for that. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.